government and I'd like to invite uh, Rowan Latham, contractor and um, contract and project lead and um, yeah to the table. Thank you. can see Ross Trotter there as well. <laughs> Thank you. Right, over to you. Yeah, Kia ora koutou. Uh, thank, thank you very much for, for making the time. Uh, today we wanted to present the draft submission on, on the government's uh, Transforming Recycling Discussion Document, a significant uh, policy document from, from the Ministry for the Environment uh, looking at how to, to remedy some of the issues in our current uh, recycling and resource recovery activities uh, as a country and I guess a really important document for Christchurch uh, in terms of the the direction we're setting for, for waste diversion and, and resource recovery. Um, in terms of the, the discussion document, uh, council staff have prepared um, the draft submission and uh, are generally in, in favour of, of the consultation piece. Uh, there's, there's a number of elements, there are three key areas. Uh, Proposals for a container return scheme, uh, which is, is for beverage containers. Uh, the, the mandated separation of, of organics, uh, both uh, implications for territorial authorities, but also for businesses in the commercial sector, and also uh, standardisation of recycling. So basically setting a, a standard set of rules across the country so that we all have clarity and uh, are able to have effective systems to manage those materials so that we, we do uh, recover those resources. So some, some pretty significant changes, you know, things that councils have, have worked out and have developed over the years, but really what we're hearing from, from, the, from the government is now they want to, to bring everyone up to those, those high-performing standards of some councils, in, including Christchurch, um, and really set, uh, I guess, a new trajectory for, for, recy pardon me, for recycling in, in New Zealand. Uh, in terms of... Uh, Key submission points. Um, first of all, it's that the submission supports the container return scheme, uh, and this is where uh, a scheme applies to all beverage containers other than fresh milk. Um, such such a scheme would shift responsibility for beverage container collection from councils to the producers of those containers. So effectively, a large portion of our curbside recycling uh, and a large cost. Um, would would be managed by industry and and I guess attached to the price of those containers and returned uh, upon on, upon collection of those containers. Uh, the submission supports improvements to household recycling, uh, particularly the standardisation of curbside recycling. So effectively, the government have set or proposed to set a standard set of curbside recyclables, and so that's things like. Uh, all bottle uh, containers uh, and jars, you know, lids off, um, some of the things that we've been pushing uh, as a council for a number of years, and it's just to get that consistency uh, up and down the country so that the true value of those uh, recoverable products can be realised. Uh, significantly, you know, the government have invested uh, in both an Auckland materials recovery facility and the Christchurch materials recovery facility, and I think this uh, goes a step further to encouraging those other territorial authority areas uh, to adopt similar approaches to their, to their recycling. Uh, we, have, we have suggested, however, that you know, in terms of the targets in the draft submission document, we think more emphasis could be put on quality of diverted materials, and we've got some commentary there in the questions, because I think what's important is obviously having the right materials separated, but also making sure that we are able to recycle those materials. So rather than just focusing on a diversion from landfill target, advocating for quality targets as well. Uh, the submission notes that contamination of curbside con recycling is a significant issue. I mean, we've had our, our issues here in Christchurch where we had uh, almost 50% of the trucks going to landfill at, at the worst time. We're now back up to you know, less than 10% of those trucks going to landfill, but that's taken a lot of effort, a lot of communications, uh, a lot of... Um, yeah, a lot of time and, and, and ratepayer money to get the recycling back to as close as it needs to be. Um, and we, I guess we see that by the government taking a more active role in that, uh, in that space in terms of promoting messaging around recycling, um, we'll be able to get that momentum and, and positive behaviour that, that is required. Um, we've also suggested that along uh, the lines of the Australian approach, we really support uh, 
the mandating of recycling labeling on packaging. So when you pick up a you know, a food and beverage container or a, a packaging, you know, container, it tells you which pieces are recyclable in New Zealand rather than sort of some ambiguity which, which currently exists in, in the market. In, in respect to separate collection of glass and fibre, both are, are flagged in the consultation document as options the government could take, but they haven't uh, proposed a preferred approach. So what we've said in the draft submission is that we... <laughs> we, we, we still think uh, that territorial authorities uh, need to have that decision-making power at this stage, and that really relates to infrastructure and processing capacity across the country. We could mandate a separate collection of, of glass or fibre, um, but would that be the best outcome you know, with our processing infrastructure and capacity within New Zealand at this point, or do instead we make those decisions on a, on a commercial and, I guess, a, a value-for-money basis? So we've said that until the infrastructure exists, councils still need that decision-making power, um, but, but that is uh, detailed in the, in the discussion document. We've also said that until the container return scheme is implemented, we don't know what those volumes are going to be. There's a significant change to the curbside recycling through this uh, policy document, and so once those uh, impacts are known, then we can adapt our system, and I guess that ties into the work that we're doing uh, with our Section 17A review and looking at those uh, processing contracts as well. So we can we can incorporate that information as we have the steer from, from central government. Uh, in terms of organics, uh, the submission supports the proposal for separate collection of organics, um, noting that we, we do agree that uh, councils should still have that option whether to go food organics only, as they're doing in some parts of the country, or a mixed system like we have here in Christchurch with food and garden organics combined. That, that gives councils the flexibility to have different processing technologies uh, as opposed uh, to just having that single source material which might um, be tied to a certain uh, processing approach. Um, again, as we, we develop options for, for processing organics, we can then tailor our, our collection system rather than collection system and then, uh, and then the output process. In terms of the commercial sector, uh, the submission also supports the proposal to phase in uh, separate food organics collections for the commercial sector, um, noting that you know all parts of society have a role to play in in the diversion of waste from landfill, and it will set uh, you know really good drivers in the market to actually get that diversion activity happening, as opposed to it just being something that councils have responsibility for. Finally, the submission aligns with the points raised in the Canterbury Mural Forum submission, and we worked with the other territorial authorities in developing that submission. And I think as a region, it speaks to the cohesiveness of, of our approach in Canterbury and also the fact that we're all kind of heading in the same direction, have the same uh, goals and agenda in terms of diversion from landfill. Uh, happy, happy to take any questions, um, but that's probably it for a, for a quick summary. I, I do apologise for the intervention because I was looking for the name of a movie which um, I watched a while ago and it was, it, it was such a good movie because it started off with the description of the you know this wonderful product that had been created you know plastic <laughs> and what an amazing product it was how it was going to make life easier and more simple and then it it, it shifted into the into the massive um, uh, piles of rubbish and um, completely indisposable the damage to the oceans and all of the all of the the downsides that of course were never imagined at the beginning of it and I'm old enough of course to remember to put the milk bottles out um, mm. before I went to bed um, originally with some tokens in it and then with all some coins and then some tokens so I mean it's just you know it's uh, yeah plus a la change plus a la meme shows you know more more things change the more they stay the same um, uh, Pauline Thank you. I guess and Aaron we could also do a documentary about the internal combustion engine as well and how wonderful <laughs> that was when it was invented. Um, but no, my, um, my question really is about if, um, if green waste goes to a landfill like Cape Valley, because I mean people think, um, tend to sometimes confuse an old dump with what we've got now, technologically constructed, engineered landfills. Um, so the big disadvantage of putting green waste out there would be transport costs and uh, processing costs are higher. But apart from that, 
the emissions are, are not high out there, are they? We, uh, I mean, yeah, you're going yeah, to have transport emissions, obviously, but I think the, well, yeah, the, I mean the, the, the big part of, of this document is about valuing resources, and I think that's where we, we lose out if we send organic material to landfill, even if it is a, a, an energy capture system in place like Cape Valley has. We're talking about producing you know, over 30,000 tonnes of organic certified compost, which increases you know, soil health at the moment with the current operation. If you put that aside and send it to landfill, you've lost a heck of a lot of resource. Yeah. Um, so th there are other, other impacts as well as obviously the transport emissions and the cost of sending it to a, to a site like Cape Valley. So you end product. Um, now the other thing too I was looking at in here was the, the um, fresh milk beverage containers, which I was pleased to see this alluded to, but um, it's looking to supporting a, uh, um, a future scheme that focuses on that. Mm because they wouldn't be included in this. Um, so would it be worth strengthening our comments around that? Because it's always actually um, amazed me or confounded me how many of those big two-litre jobs must be going through our cafes in the urban environment in New Zealand. That's massive, isn't it? Yeah. So, I mean, to, to get that work speeded up would be really preferable, I think, in my view, um, because that's going to involve another... Stewardship scheme and how long is that going to take? So it yeah. might be also supporting um, R and D to find another way. I know some of them are starting to use kegs and things now. Yeah. Um, and then just one more question was um, with the I noticed some of the um, takeaway um, restaurants are starting to use cardboard packaging for food. Is that compostable or is that like your milk cartons, has it got a uh, plastic lining? Do you know? It, it varies. Yeah. Um, what, what's uh, what's included in this consultation document is they've they've suggested the government have suggested uh, mandated products for organics, yeah. and they've excluded fibre products. So at the moment in Christchurch, we allow fibre products in our process, and so that's you know uh, short fibre things like uh, hand towels and tissues and. Uh, non-recyclable paper products like pizza boxes and, and other cardboard products. What the Ministry have flagged in this consultation document is that they do consider a risk, particularly with food containers, and that's around some of the attached contaminants in those linings. So things like PFO or PFOS uh, type linings. Yeah. And so they've said because of those risks, they don't support the inclusion of fibre in that mandated list. And that's one of the pieces that we've pushed back on because mm. you know we've seen how that fibre product can be accepted in an organics process. And I guess we don't want to limit uh, the diversion opportunity of those organic materials, i.e. those fibre products, just because of some risk associated with food products. We'd much rather see those food product containers regulated and you know restrictions on, on emerging contaminants like PFOS, PFOA and that family of uh, chemicals rather than exclude all fibre because of the risk of, of those particular contaminants. Yeah, because it has a benefit of not contaminating the rest of the stuff in our yeah. recyclables. But then again, if you're offsetting that with standardisation, then they're looking for a standardised processing uh, methodology throughout New Zealand so that the consumer knows wherever you are, that goes in that bin. So you're looking to ask them to standardise a model that will accept fibre and the green waste. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. Part of that will come back to, to the correct labelling because, uh, you know, a lot of labelling mm. compostable and there's a lot of greenwash and it's, it's really just having that um, accurate label so people know what they can actually do with that container. If it, yeah. if it is able to be compost in a commercial environment or if it, is that referring to a, a, a compost, that a home cost boss, composting facility that may take a year or two to break down that material. So it's really having that clarification over the, the labelling and, and, and specific to that material. It is hard Thanks. for the consumer though, because, yeah. you know, I mean, if you're shopping, you know, I won't mm. name a shop, but, uh, you know, I bought a little rubbish bin for food scraps, um, but it came, it, you could, it, no, it actually literally came with a roll of um, green um, little plastic, plastic key type, soft and plastic key bags. type yeah. things. Um, which said they're um, compostable, uh, compostable. Oh. and and I used them until I was told they weren't. Mm. 
Yeah. And um, and I so I never bought any more, but it just shows you how easy for someone Absolutely. who's trying to do the right thing um, to to make a mistake. But the the, the the pizza boxes, for example, not that I order a lot of pizza, um, but um, they 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 don't have any of that contamination risk. No, no. So no. Okay. So it, it's really those you know um, food takeaway boxes yeah. that often have sort of a, a plastic like lining, sheen and that will be. Them. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that will be the issue. So I think what, what the Ministry have said in the consultation piece is that all fibre should be excluded. And what we're advocating for is that there are certain fibre types that, that should be able to be composted. Yeah. And there are certainly fibre products that are currently on the market that shouldn't be accepted. So it's not as simple as all fibre or no fibre. It's actually compostable fibre versus... But we could be you know, blunt. I mean, yeah. if it's cardboard, it's it's OK, you know, sort of, um, yeah. But as, as Ross says, it's all about the labelling and Absolutely. the amount of information that's now being required to go on labelling is getting incredible. I mean, I saw last night we're going to have to start putting how many calories are in our beers now. So it's going to be like we're going to need a huge label for oh, every... I have to say that <laughs> putting, putting cal cal calories on... Um, on alcohol products is a very yeah, good um, alcohol <laughs> harm reduction measure. Um, uh, Aaron and then Phil. Uh, yeah, so just um, a, a couple of questions. One is, and the first one's quite a simple one, and some people say I'm a simple person, because uh, I have sometimes simple solutions, but why do we not have a fourth bin for um, green waste, which stays at your house? Why do we not, because a lot of people can't afford to go to Bunnings and spend fifteen hundred, three hundred dollars on a compost bin. As part of our package, why do we not supply that and encourage people to compost at home? Because we have all the other bins, and then we use carbon to take it away and do all sorts of things. But the best place to deal with compost is at your own property, and even two people could ask for three if they're using them. That's it's not a bad thing. Why would have we considered that? Yeah, look, there has been some, some work done previously. You might have heard of Pikachu bins and um, home composting. And, the what, uh, sorry? Pikachu bins and, and home, home composting and trying to encourage that behaviour. And look, some people do pick up on that. For, for, for others, it's the convenience of providing that, that curbside collection um, and also having that organic material in there so um, yeah it's really to do with the, the, the uptake of, of you know what the what the residents uh, and, and the, what we're seeing is that the preference is to have that uh, curbside collection with the green waste and it's the preference I think Aaron's well, raising a different point that I haven't heard before that which is is that something that I mean our buying power surely must be greater than um, individual consumers. Yeah. Well, the, the yeah. 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 Yes. So we've given out recycled bins. Composting bins. Compost bins. Yeah. Discounted. Yeah. But but the but for the consumer, if you live in a flat or even a state house, I'm not sure how many people around the table have lived in one before, but I don't see a lot of compost bins at state houses. And it would be a lot of them are on quarter acre sections still. It's it's a great use and it's great for the ground, it's, it's, it's just good all round, but when you're on the budget of someone in a state house, going down and buying one, even at a reduced cost, it, it, you've got to make a decision on something else. Whereas... Is, it, is, is this included in the, um, is this included in the, in the submission? Is this an issue we can cover off in the submission, or...? Is it an issue we can cover off? Mm -hmm. Don't, yeah, it's, it's, I haven't seen it yet that, that it's been referred to specifically. It's more around the um, uh, mandating, the separation of that material for collection. Yeah, and I'd, I'd just add that uh, obviously Council has previously uh, promoted those types of approaches. Um, there are a number of approaches around the country that are very successful. So there's one based in Auckland where they have a, a compost trainer, effectively, who comes to your house and teaches you how to, to do the composting, and then they list composting sites on, on, a, on a website and a map. And so that's something that we're also doing, you know, is working with those community groups about having community composting hubs. So, you know, both residential composting at home and also community-based composting will form bar, part of the picture. But what we're saying here is in terms of the collection system and I guess the, the mandate from central government to have an organic system, you still require to have that collection system as well as those you know waste diversion activities a absolutely but if even three percent of households took up a compost bin program in Christchurch that would make a considerable 
difference. Yeah, but and, as long as they knew how to use it. So I, I'm interested yeah. in this. So is there something that we could just simply add a, a sort of an, a note that staff will, you know, yeah. report back on, on this and, issue? And, and we were, um, Well, kids learn composting in school. So a great way would be that then five in one class might actually go, actually, we don't even have a compost bin at home. And then, cool, we'll give you one. They do, then, they do teach it at schools. No, no, you learn at school. Yeah. But then if your parents can't afford to go buy one of the nice bins, then... Well, you don't, but... Wait, leaving, leaving all that aside, leaving yeah, all that aside, I think it would be worth... Because that's the first time I've heard that Auckland have, a, have like an education component. I just w just wouldn't mind if we just simply note... not not We don't have to resolve that staff will by X date, but just note that staff will do a, a little bit more investigation into the into the issue that Councillor Kewan has raised and report back through um, Pauline's committee. Yeah, yeah, perfect. And then I had another one. Yep. Yeah, so completely different. Um, just around, because I see that it's 20 cents per vessel is the proposed price. And um, so that obviously is going to put the cost of goods up. And then the, so that makes it more expensive. But the actual environmental outcomes, have we seen evidence on how that works? Because what, won't people still be putting glass in our recycle bin? And therefore contaminating and then that's still got to be dealt with and so on and so forth i believe i believe it would be a combination so the the proposed scheme will obviously will put that advanced disposal fee or that 20 cents per container at the front end you know where, where a consumer is purchasing the container yeah. there will be an entity set up to manage those funds and there will be agents set up to collect those containers and then the return will happen to those consumers so they'll pay 20 cents on it at the front end and they'll get 20 cents back when they cash in those containers so from a a cost of living aspect, there shouldn't be a significant change. In terms of the the processing and who's collecting that material and where it's going, that is yet to be determined by that scheme. So what the government have proposed is that they want to implement the scheme, they now need to develop that scheme. But certainly we would still expect to see some containers in the curbside collection. I mean, we already accept glass jars and, and other uh, items, you know, that would still come through our curbside collection. But what we're saying is that there's likely to be a significant decrease in beverage containers through this scheme. Uh, it won't negate the need for a, a curbside recycling bin, but it will mean that we have lower volume so we get greater collection uh, you know, efficiencies out of, out of that network. Yeah, and the, in the beverage containers, does that include aluminium cans? Yes, yes. So all, all beverage up, containers. So they all go up by 20 cents. And plastic bottles. The, the, the work that the government did was looking at the, when they set the rate or proposed rate of 20 cents was looking at overseas examples yep. and uh, the higher that return, um, the more likely, more likely to But fit. Aaron, this is the submission. Yeah. This is the submission. It's not the detailed policy work that government's going to be doing. So I, I do want to move through and I've picked up one of your um, issues that you've raised because it's separate from the report. Is there anything else that's so, so relation, just finally then, related to the submission? Yeah, um, just finally then, if if it's super successful... Which part of the submission is this? Sorry? Which part of the submission? Oh, well, the bit that says we support it. Um, if if it's super successful support and, the everyone, of and everyone recycles, like, I mean, everyone takes every single bottle and can and stuff back and gets all the money back, how's the scheme then funded? So if you if you I mean you can imagine how how the scheme is set up yeah. and it works with extended producer responsibility schemes across across the world. Yeah. A whole revenue take is taken when that product enters the market. That money sits in a pot and is used to fund those re returns when they're reclaimed. So there's always more money in that system than is is returned. Does that make sense? There's always there's always product sitting on a shelf that hasn't yet been sold, hasn't yet been consumed, and so there's an excess of funds which cover the administrative costs of running that scheme right. and provide um, that buffer, if you like, between amount paid and return paid. There's also some leakage. You know, no scheme uh, has had 100% capture. So any leakage, and that's why uh, we favour the proposed approach, which is a uh, deposit approach rather than at sale. So industry have lobbied for at sale, which means when they sell a container, they pay a deposit. But what we've said is when the container is produced, then that deposit is is made. Cool. Yeah, so the, the revenue in that system will, will cover that. I've got a couple of others. I've got 
Phil um, and Celeste and Sarah. So thanks, guys. Very good. Just just to follow on from Erin, so it's every beverage which is bottle is uh, either glass or plastic or um, aluminium. aluminium. That's yeah. fine. No problem. There is liquid paper cardboard as well. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. No, that's fine. So if if our because the very nicely the government have given us um, sixteen odd million for a new move machine, which is cool, and I know it's going to be a lot more efficient. If we are put, if we're taking all that glass, which is heavy, and a wee bit of plastic and some aluminium cans, if in the past we were putting a hundred tons through the move, it was costing us X dollars a ton. If we're putting half the amount through, the move's still going to cost the same amount to run. So, even though the glass will be taken away, well, I'll pick on glass. If the glass is taken away and it's all sorted, then that's good. If we're putting less quantity, uh, less weight through our MRF, the price will have to go up because it still costs X to run the move. You see where I'm coming from? Yeah, there's certain overhead for, um, but the, then of course, uh, grass, glass itself is quite abrasive on the, the plant as well. So you, you'd yeah. have uh, reduction maintenance there, but uh, but it is the yeah, there, there, will be, there will be fixed overhead. Um, but of course, the throughput will be a lot less, and we we would it would be a saving to council. Okay, all right. Um, then just to follow on from what um, Pauline brought up. Uh, oh, sorry. Christchurch is leading the way, really, as far as our organics goes, because we're, we're, we're doing the way the government wants it to mix in the card. We're, we're sort of doing it the way they'd like everyone else to do it. Um, just saying, to in the interim, perhaps we might be carting our green waste to... Or our green bin waste to Cape Valley. Um, just to put um, Pauline's mind at rest, at Cape Valley, we capture 96% of the methane. So it's... We're, it's all capped over. It's all good, and we um, we've got four one megawatt um, generators, which throw the as you know throw the power out. So it's to relevant the, to the submission, hmm? isn't it? Pardon? It's just, lot, quite a lot, really. Just no, questioning just, relevance uh, to the submission. Yeah. It, you can always talk to Pauline afterwards. Um, you know, she was just concerned about <laughs> the methane levels. that we were getting rid of, yeah. and, and uh, there's nothing to worry about as far as methane goes. We'll cover that in that report we bring back yeah. on the twenty sixth. Mm. Yeah, thank right. you. Celeste and Sarah. Um, it's, I think it falls slightly out of this, but it's just following on from Aaron's point, which I think is a good one. Um, under the Waste Minimisation Fund, I see that Auckland have got living compost hubs. So, you know, it, it's, it's for commercial businesses, it's for residences. It's good for that kind of focus on urban density. So you can sort of, um, in addition to what um, Aaron pointed out, would work at home. It would also allow us to scale it up and access funding through that other mechanism um, as part of that climate resilience infrastructure that would be quite good to develop. So using maybe community gardens and then having to, and, and then those gardens themselves might be able to benefit through, you know, producing soil that, yeah, mm. so on and so forth. But anyway, it's just an interesting idea, mm. which we might've already done work on. I'm just adding that um, investigation report back on supporting home slash community slash commercial composting. So, I mean, it just is a broad well, it, brush approach. Yeah, it's not, it, to me, it's not so much investigate, it's about providing you with information on what's happening around the country. Yeah. So, um, investigate okay. is, is, is okay. more optioneering to me, but... Staff will um, um, provide, provide advice. Just, just provide advice. Yeah, not just... Well, pro provide information... information about um, what other parts of the country are doing to support home slash community yeah. slash commercial composting. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's also and part that, of that, our... that enables us to have a look at it. And, and, and it's part of our program as well, so exactly. we can give you all of that, us and other parts of the country. Okay. Information on what we because and other parts of the country w. are doing to support home slash community slash commercial composting. Okay, um, Sarah? Thanks, a couple of things. Um, firstly, actually just off the back of that, we had a, um, a, a long-term plan submission from Bailey Perryman looking at doing that um, community scale, doing a trial of a community scale um, composting. Mm. And there was a resolution off the back of that um, for staff to work with him on, on what's happening. So if we could just, not right now, but if we could get some information back on that because we've already... We can include that in there. Today we really do need to, to try and focus on the 
yeah, yeah that's why I'm saying just, that's, just that we could just, just yeah that. that's why I've said not for now just yeah. provide that um so the because I thought I had a bit of time today I was being <laughs> helpful and that the um councillor had raised an issue which yeah. obviously oh, was an issue, issue that we could just simply do a noting provision on rather than um but we really do need to yeah. focus on the submission so the um the standardisation makes complete sense because um, people share information across the country on social media about what they can and can't recycle, and that's caused confusion in the past. Yep. When it comes to labelling of the containers, and you've talked about labelling there, there's not a lot in here because the labelling itself, there's the greenwash aspect, what can and can't be um, recycled. But there's two other things I think we need to comment on. The, the first is the visibility of the actual label. So currently you might get a clear indentation on clear plastic that says, you know, two, three, five, seven, whatever. Incredibly difficult to, to see if you have any sort of, well, there's lots of different ones, you know. I know, but once you've like, the only ones that you can recycle. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, they're really hard to see. But you need to know if it says three so that you don't recycle it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so the, the, it needs to be more visible in some way. Um, it's both size... For and, and for people with you know fading vision like mine, and um, but the other thing is sometimes they put labels on plastic containers that mean that it's then not recyclable because they put a paper product label on the plastic itself, and so whether something could be done to make it really clear what um, producers need to do in that space. Yeah, and look, I have seen examples um, overseas where they will have you know what the the top the code for the top and how to recycle that the, yep. the body of the, the the bottle for example that's it how that's recycled the label all that yeah, is, yeah. all that so, information's on there and a size that is visible so yeah so that the labeling itself may, needs to make it really clear what's recyclable what's not if the container itself like a, a strawberry punnet for example may be completely recyclable but as soon as the producer puts a label on it you know the you know the retailer or whoever the strawberry producer as opposed to the plastic producer it means that it's not, mm -hmm. um, those kind of things. But that's really not clear on any of the labelling, neither from the producer of the plastic or the label, yep. you know, put her on her at the strawberry we um, can, or whatever. Um, we can look at the wording around yeah. that mm. and beef that up in the submission. It, it, yeah, it, there has been some work done on the little fruit labels as well. Um, obviously, yes, they're an miss, issue in composting, yeah, so yeah. making them biodegradable. Yeah, yeah. That's great, thanks. I've got um, Anne and then Yanni. Focus no, it's fine. My okay. question's been answered. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, and, and sorry if it's if it's covered in here. Um, but the Tetra Packs issue is that what what is that classified as, and where is that? <coughs> Liqu liquid paperboard cartons. So those liquid paperboard cartons are those yeah. blended fiber, aluminium, plastic right. beverage containers like Tetra right. Pack. There are other brands out there as well, and so this scheme would include those containers. The only thing that's exempt in terms of a beverage container is fresh milk. So that and means it would pick up almond milk, soy milk, all of those, but any, and UHT, you know, all of those details, but fresh milk is, is proposed to be exempt. So the fresh milk, do we know what the scale of those containers is for fresh milk? Not off the top of my head, off, but yeah. it is, I, think, I believe it's either in the consultation document or in the regulatory impact right. statement, which associates... With, with this proposal. And why would you, like, what's the rationale behind um, excluding fresh milk containers if those other containers are going to be captured? Isn't it the same I material? Think Councillor Cotter um, sort of uh, mentioned they're looking at a separate scheme around that, but the thing to remember with the, the HDPE, which is the, the milk container, is probably the highest value plastic. So there's already a lot of um, good systems in place for that to be recycled within New Zealand. So there's a high demand for that. For that um, plastic type, so so, that, but the the government is looking at capturing more of the commercial, the commercial aspect as well, and looking at a separate scheme around that. And and in terms of the the submission, sorry, the the consultation document, it considers fresh milk to be a staple, and you know, uh, I guess part of everyday consumption, as opposed to a, a luxury good, for want of a better word. Whereas those beverage containers are optional. No one, you know. The, the, the people's free choice to choose to buy a you know a can of drink or a, you know whichever. So I think that's why the government have taken that separate approach and excluded fresh milk because they consider it to be a staple of of living in New Zealand to have access to fresh milk. 
Right. But I don't get what that's got to do with not recycling. It's not about not recycling. As, in terms of the Tetra Pak issue. That, that's not, um, I guess, not the, the issue because the Tetra Packs, the liquid paperboard cartons are included. Right. Um, what, what we know is that, you know, Tetra Pak and other organisations producing those products are looking at their own producer responsibility schemes as well. So I think that piece of work will sit alongside this as opposed are they, to being Are they included. currently... Can I, at, sorry, can I, just, can I just clarify? Yeah. With regard to the milk cartons, it's about exclusion from the container return scheme. <laughs> yes. It's not sure. about exclusion from recycling. It's about exclusion right. from getting your... So it's not about I, not I, recycling I get, I get them. Yep. It's about saying they're not included in the container return scheme. Right. Okay? Yes. That's what I, where I think the confusion may be. And I think it is because they have a recognised value. Your liquid paper carton board, a um, lot harder to recycle, and there will probably be um, uh, a... Uh, premium put on that from the manufacturer to include that in the scheme. So that will try and discourage them from manufacturing with that product. Sorry, so just, just to be clear, currently the Tetra Packs can't be recycled at the moment? Very difficult and there's, there's not, not through normal MIRTH activities such as ours. Is there, is there any councils that can recycle it or is there any ability for us to collect that separately so like there's, people to drop it yeah, off. there's the, the tough board plant isn't there the new yes. new facility in the north island to process those bonded plastic fiber products um, and they are setting up those collections so that, that that piece of work is happening it's just it's not part of this consultation oh, okay. again, should we not be trying to, this, to get something in the south island but it's separate to this consultation this consultation we just stick to the submission the, this is the submission the, on the um yeah. What, the, what the government's put out. Yeah, so on the yes, discussion. And that'll document. be part of what we talk yeah. about as a council moving forward and how we develop and change our activities into the future. The, the one additional through. set of wording yeah. that I'm, I'm just getting Sorry. written into this one is the um, is, is um, with with some additional wording um, with respect to um, uh, the quality of labelling. Yep. So, so that it's picking up really a, a several points that have been made by, by councillors. So, so I, I think we do need to focus so that people know exactly whether it is it go which 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 one it goes to. It's obvious. So, should we should we always also be taking the opportunity to, um, while acknowledging that it's important to go to the organics, um, talk about government funding? No, can can we just stick to the actual? Submission that's in front of us today. What? I, do. I, I thought they are talking about organics collection, separation of business food waste. They are. Um, and I guess the the point is like. And they're talking about the principle of they're talking about the principle of of ensuring that it happens countrywide. And do we support that? Yeah. The, yep. next, the next step is going to be how is it all funded and how is it set up and what and what, what policy is actually put in place and what infrastructure is in place and how do we do that? And that 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 is that is aligned as we've been talking about with with the conversations that we've been having with you about what we're doing with our organics processing plant. Yeah, no, I I get that, and it's that's not for this document. This document is about the policy that the government's looking to set up for a national policy. Do we agree with having yeah, a so national policy statement? Do we agree with this approach? Do we agree with the words? We're very we, we want to add in words about the need yeah. to have clarity around um, around labouring labelling um, into the submission. But here, here you go. Do you do you agree? Councils without existing infrastructure should have until twenty thirty to deliver food scrap collections. Forty six. Do you agree? Councils with access to suitable existing infrastructure should have until twenty twenty five. Then forty five goes on. The time process depending on whether new processing facilities are needed. Do you agree with a phased approach? Number 44, do you think councils should play a role in increasing the diversion of household garden waste from landfills? The point I guess I was trying to understand is, like, given where we're at because we've had no nationalisation of what's collectible and the processing and the technology, we've ended up with a whole bunch of different um, facilities across the country that can do different things. So I would have thought government, if we're moving to the organics type um, collection, that we should actually want government to be involved around standardisation and access to like regional facilities that do the same thing, rather than everyone going off and doing their own thing independently, which is kind of what, what we've got and probably why we've had the the kind of call for some of these things to be introduced. That, that I mean, 
that that's the point I was making because I mean you you saw. Is there a COVID. response to what Councillor Johansson? I think said. I think you know the the general response is that the 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 document you know places um, that mandate into the into the domain, saying you know do you agree with a mandate to separate the separate the collection of organics both at a territorial authority level and there's those standardised set and also for commercial organics. And what we're saying in the submission is that yes, we support that because that will then lead on to all of those things that, that you're asking for in terms of you know the required infrastructure, the systems, the consistency, you know the, the regional infrastructure that's needed. But to get to that point, we need to have you know a, a consistent set of rules so that we've got the demand for that processing and infrastructure and investment. Yeah, so in asked and answered. So um, Anne, I'm interested that um, nowhere here we, is there any discussion about the waste from business in terms of packaging and things like that. So is that going to be dealt with in the future? So yeah. there, there's already um, six priority products that have been identified for the government for for an extended producer responsibility type approach, and one of those is packaging. So I think those aspects, you know, and there's tyres, there's electronic waste, there's agricultural uh, containers, there's packaging. The government's already put those wheels in motion, as it were, by saying these are areas that we need to address. What this specific document is addressing is, I guess, the gaps in our recycling system and our, and our organics diversion processes. And it's saying we're going to provide a mandate and clear direction about the expectations on councils and industry on those specific elements, as opposed to some of the other part of the work program around yeah, climate change, uh, the emissions reduction plan, and those priority products. Thank you. I, I guess that, um, yeah, I really appreciate all of the work that um, you've done on bringing this submission to us, and we, I think we had a workshop on this, and um, we've really drilled into it, so I really appreciated um, all of the hard work of everyone in that regard. Pauline, would you like to move this? Um, Sarah, would you like to second it? Um, I'll put that motion. All those in favour? What? Sorry, did you want to bait it? The submission that we're going to we we the the submission on a discussion document. All right, Aaron, lead off the debate. Absolutely, I I think it is important to debate. But submissions, we could all just sit around and say yes, just send in a submission. But if every council in the country, even if they had some concerns about aspects of it, just all said yes, the government would go great. Let's just plough ahead. No questions here. Nothing to see here. Move on and do it. I mean. There's been plenty of questions around this table, I thought, over this and the way forward. Um, and I'm not 100% convinced that this will deliver the outcomes that we're looking to uh, to get. It will deliver some, absolutely, but, but not all of them. Um, and I'm not seeing enough evidence. I know it's going to put up the cost of living for a number of people. Some will claw that back because they'll spend hours they could spend doing something else, going to collect their bottles and cans and everything else and take them back but it, that just becomes a money go round it doesn't actually solve the problems um, for me uh, organics at source at your home is is fantastic and um, a lot more growth there would be good uh, the container stuff I like a number of people in our community thought that when there was going to be a container return scheme it was going to be recycling and reusing uh, a bottle uh, like we once did. Um, that, that made sense. It certainly works in a cafe. You go in and you use the cup. It gets used 80 odd times, I think, is the number that you hear around. So I don't know. It's, uh, is, is this the best way forward? For me, there's still far too many questions. And council should never just put in submissions and all green, uh, green light them and say everything's great when it could be better. I think it could still be better. And uh, I have not seen any evidence, and we haven't even been shown countries overseas where it's actually done well. In fact, I've been sent a couple of emails from where the opposite's happened and there's needed to be major changes made because it didn't get the outcome it was intended. Because we always seem to forget about human behaviour. is the big one we always forget as a council. You can tell people to do something and you can even show them all the reasons why you might do it. doesn't mean they actually do do it. We have to factor that in. So... Um, I'm not 100% thrilled about this. And sorry for debating it when we've got such a heavy uh, day ahead of us. Yanni. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I share the concern. I, I wasn't, I guess, reassured from the workshop and the presentation that we had that a container um, return scheme um, will, will be as beneficial as I think it's being promoted as. Um, I guess the concern that I have is... Um, 
it would be much better, I think, to separate glass at the curbside and get better value um, through using the existing mechanisms that we have or new ones that are established around our three bin or our four bin system. Uh, I, I just think that um, the reality is that a lot of the container return um, products will not include all the glass and therefore what do you do with that other glass and what's the impact that that has on contaminating our existing recycling etc so uh, i think for me like um yeah i i am concerned about what's being proposed and the implications on um what we could do i know that there's been some studies overseas that have shown um i think in the in the uk um uh in in wales um which you know, has kind of said that they think that a good curbside recycling model for glass packaging would del deliver 11% more carbon savings than including glass in a DRS. So, you know, I, I'm just not convinced that this is the right approach. I, I think um, the scale of what's established, you know, will have a negative impact on our ability to do our recycling and probably get a worse outcome for the end product. So, um, yeah, I, 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 like, I think there's a lot of good stuff in the submission that we've put forward, but I also think that if we're not learning the lesson from what um, has happened in the past around just leaving it to each council to decide their own thing um, without support from central government to standardise what can be collected um, and recycled, then we just end up in a, in a pickle. And, you know, especially when it comes to things like organic processing, I think government does have a role to play around providing support, subsidies to get the facilities put in place if it's going to mandate that councils have to do it. So um, I, I don't know why we'd be silent on that. But um, yeah, I appreciate the, the work that's gone on into the submission. And I think also, you know, I think there's things that we can do locally. Like we could set up a separated glass collection at our current eco sites um, that people could start changing their behaviour to get better value of the materials that we currently Recycle. I, I think that both Selwyn and Wymac have done it. It's not a big thing to do. Aaron's also raised um, ideas about um, local composting as well. So I just think um, we shouldn't be limited by what government are doing. We should also take the opportunity to do things ourselves. And I know that you've done some really positive things around like battery recycling as well. So I just want to acknowledge that. Thank you. Um, uh, Paul, uh, sorry, I've had um, Sarah and then Pauline. Oh no, Sarah. I'll come to you at the end. Uh, Pauline. I'll come to you at the end because you moved the resolution. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, so let's remember what we're talking about here today. You know, it's a council submission on a discussion document. It's not a submission on legislation. And it's really clear that um, as a council, we're not just green lighting the discussion document. Um, that's not our role. And it's really clear from our submission that we're not just rubber stamping anything and that we have feedback and that we would like changes um, to much of the stuff that's being proposed. You know, we live on a planet with finite resources and we haven't been using them wisely, um, especially when it comes to those resources where we're mining sand for glass, for example, um, the organic waste, it needs to go back on the land um, instead of just into the landfill. And whether that's at scale going to farms or whether that's small in people's backyards, um, the principle still stands. The proposal from the government makes it clear that greenwashing won't be accepted anymore and it has been around for a while and it's been really confusing for people and I think that it's great that clear labelling and standardisation of recycling will make it much easier for us as a nation to get that right. You know, we have a large land area but a small population and um, we're isolated from the rest of the world and so resources that we do have that are imported have a high carbon footprint and making sure that they are reused, recycled efficiently is really good. What's not in here because it's not part of the, the waste minimisation and the product stuff is, um, is refusing. And actually a lot of these initiatives will help people think about actually whether they um, purchase products in the first place as well. And that will go a long way to um, reducing the waste, which is really good. I think getting the, the labelling right so that people can actually see um, what is recyclable and what is not will be really important. Um, but I think that getting it standardised as a nation is, is key. Thanks. Uh, thank you. I've got Melanie. Um, just sure. Um, I sub support the submission. Um, I like what um, Aaron said about composting. We do it at home and our local community garden does it too. They offer people can take um, any sort of food waste etc around to get it composted. 
And I support the container return scheme. I think it's the perfect way to get kids excited about recycling and make some pocket money. So um, I think this is fantastic. Um, but just before I come to you, Pauline, I'll just say a couple of words. Um, we held a workshop on this on the 12th of April this year, so that's nearly a month ago. Councillors have been um, really well informed and engaged in this process. They've been given the opportunity to provide feedback to staff so that that could be incorporated in the draft um, uh, dis uh, response to the discussion document um, that we have before us today. Um, some councillors this morning in the debate or in the questioning have raised issues that are outside the scope of the submission. But rather than rule them out of order, I have allowed that to, um, to be discussed uh, with staff um, in the interest of you know, transparency and um, the, the general interest that councillors have always shown in these issues. Um, and uh, I have sought to include this particular one, which was just referenced by, um, by Councillor Coker, and um, I've included that, that in the resolution in a way that the staff now have um, you know, some knowledge about what the expectation of Council is in terms of what, what would help us in terms of some of the future direction issues. Um, I was the Mayor that actually insisted that um, these submissions come to Council for open public debate. Um, they're not our decisions and they're not just council submissions. The, the government has asked for submissions from across New Zealand. So there, there are New Zealanders from different parts of the country, from our own city, that will put in um, submissions on this. And I think that's a good thing. We need to have a public debate about the reality that we have been not pricing the cost of externalities. We have not been pricing the cost of plastic and its disposal into anything that we do. Nothing. And uh, this is a fantastic opportunity for us to say to the government, we want you to standardise this process and you want those that make these products uh, take responsibility for funding the product stewardship, which um, stewardship's just a joke in terms of um, what's really happened uh, in relation to, to this issue. So I think the councillors feel very strongly about this issue. So I don't think that... Um, anyone was try trying to close down a debate, I, I think what we're trying to do is to focus our attention on what we can contribute to a public debate and also what we can um, contribute in terms of our own consideration of where we go forward as a council. So Pauline, I'll hand over to you to close oh, the debate. Oh, thanks, Lynn. You just can't pick it, can you? But um, Look, I don't have much to add. I think you and Sarah have covered most of it really well, except to say that, look, this is a really good submission and the simplicity of the way it's presented is really easy to read, but it belies a huge amount of work that's gone into this behind the scenes, and I know you've been working on this for a very long time. Um, and regarding the um, container return scheme, we know there's going to be a lot of glass that doesn't qualify to go into that, so we will still have the opportunity, and I believe staff are working on this, um, to either look at a, a separated collection or drop off point for that. So that's not off the table for any council to do that with glass that doesn't uh, qualify for the retainer con uh, return scheme. So basically that's all I really want to say. I think there's a lot of councils that um, put this particularly focused on the green waste issues that are not being addressed and actually adding to huge climate change uh, emissions. So um, the standardisation of, um, of the process and the labouring is probably some of the key points in this that I really support. So, yeah, I'll be supporting this today, and thank you for the work on it. Thank you very much. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you very much. Sorry, can I just have my, um, just vote for the Becky's item, point 28, because I'm happy to support. So, can we go I'm saying it's only just 28. Point twenty eight in the submission. So um, Yani and Aaron. Thank you. Thank you. Right, the next item on the agenda is um, the 